All right, I think, I think we're time to get started here. How's everybody doing today? I need some nods or some thumbs up or something to get some feedback here. Okay, everybody's enjoying the conference so far? Well, I'm certainly enjoying the conference. Um, my name's Jared Smith, like I said earlier in my lightning talk. Um, happy to be here. This is my second time in India, and uh, I, I, I absolutely love to come and visit your country and, and you know, taste the good food and, and, and share with the friends and, and, and family I have here. Um, it's always a, a treat for me to be able to visit. So uh, I want to talk today a little bit about a content management system uh, on the web called Drupal. Anybody here used Drupal before or heard of Drupal? A few people. How many people know what a content management system is? It's a, it's, it's a, a web-based application for being able to add different types of, of web content. Maybe that's blog posts. Maybe that's articles. Maybe that's information about places you visited or places you want to visit or a place to put pictures to show your friends, um, those sorts of things. And one of the more, more popular content management systems out there is called Drupal. So I want to talk about a little bit about Drupal and specifically the new version of Drupal that's going to come out later this year, version 8. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I have the best job in the world. I work for a web hosting company called Bluehost, and they pay me to go around and speak at conferences and help open source communities and, and that sort of thing. So they actually pay me to come and have fun and speak to you. Best job in the world, like I said. Really, my job is, is, is somewhat of a community support manager or computer, community support officer. My job is to go out and help open source communities. Now, you pro if, if, if you were in here for my lightning talk, you probably know that I, I kind of like photography, and it's, it's been a passion of mine. And in the photography community, there's a saying about photographers, and, it's, and, and they say that amateur photographers worry about their gear. They worry about what kind of a camera do I have, and should I buy this camera or that camera? You know, um, they, they say that professional photographers worry about money. Okay, what's my next you know, photography gig that I'm going to do to, to make some money. Am I going to go shoot a wedding or am I going to shoot a concert or, you know, what, what am I going to do to, to, to get, you know, my next paycheck? Master photographers worry about light. They don't worry about the gear. They don't worry about the money. They just focus on the light. And so my hope with my talk today here is to hopefully shine a little bit of light on the subject of content management systems, shine a little bit of light on, on, on what's happening in Drupal. And, and go on from there. Um, I want to talk about, uh, uh, for a moment about measuring how far Drupal has come and how far Drupal still has to go. Um, right now, Drupal is, is the, the number two content management system uh, in the world as far as open source content management systems go. Um, slightly behind WordPress, but the, the difference between uh, you know, a WordPress site typically and a Drupal site is that typically a WordPress site has a smaller number of users, smaller number of administrators. Um, and so WordPress tends to get used on the smaller sites. Drupal, on the other hand, um, especially over the last year or two, has really focused on bigger sites, a uh, larger number of concurrent users. Um, a lot of government sites use Drupal. Um, in the United States, you know, the White House site, um, you know, whitehouse.gov um, runs on Drupal. A lot of the other government sites run on Drupal. Um, which has been great for the open source communities to, 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 you know, to see the government finally embracing all this hard work that we've been, we've been putting into, uh, open source. So with, with Drupal, um, up until, you know, over, over the past, you know, 10, 12 years, however Drupal's been along, um, we've made a number of, uh, of releases. Drupal 7 came out about, 2012, if I remember correctly. And it's been, it was a good release, but Drupal 8's really the one we've been working on for the past several years, trying to get it ready for release. Uh, we're in pretty good shape right now. Um, I'm guessing that it'll probably be released, released later this year. We're in the beta phase of the, the release cycle, so we do a bunch of development and we have a bunch of you know, work that gets done, and then we start releasing betas, and the, the 11th beta should be out um, probably early next week if I had to guess. Um, and then, uh, you know, there will probably be, if I had to guess, three or four more betas before before we're ready to decide, okay, this this, this is really ready to launch. Um, we, uh, 
we know when when Drupal is ready to launch by the number of what we call critical bugs that are that have been reported that haven't been fixed yet. Um, anytime a bug gets reported in the Drupal community, we try to do some triage on that and say, is it critical? Is it important? Or is it just a nice to fix but is not urgent and not you know doesn't warrant holding up the release of that of that software? So we're getting close. I think we're somewhere around twenty twenty one outstanding bugs that need to get fixed before we launch Drupal eight. That doesn't mean there's only 21 bugs in the software. It just means there's a 21 bugs that absolutely have to get fixed before we'll make the release. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the infrastructure or the scaffolding for, for Drupal. How many people here have used Drupal again? Raise your hands. A few of you. Um, was it painful to get started? That's all right. You can, you can admit it. Say yes. It... Especially in, in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, it, it became more and more complicated to get started with a website in Drupal simply because you kind of had to understand all the different moving pieces. And those moving pieces weren't always in Drupal itself. Sometimes you had to install Drupal and then install a bunch of third-party modules to really get a website that was actually functional. Um, so in Drupal 8, we've tried to focus on, on fixing that so that we, so it's actually easier to get started from the beginning. Um, you know, with, with, with something that, that actually works out of the box. Um, Drupal was built, Drupal 8 was specifically built for kind of modern um, web development standards. You know, Drupal 7 was really built on PHP 4, you know, functional PHP programming. Um, in Drupal 8, we've built on some of the new functionality in the PHP language with object orientation, um, namespaces, those sorts of things. So everything in Drupal 8 is object-oriented PHP. Um, we, we've even gone, gone so far as to make it work with PHP 7, even though PHP 7 hasn't been released yet. Um, so it's kind of mod modern PHP. It's also designed for the modern web. When Drupal 7 was released, we, we had this assumption that everything is a web page. Well, it, you know, in, in the year 2015, not everything is a web page. You might want things rendered as a, a JSON object or an XML or an RSS feed or some other thing. So, Drupal becomes less of just a, a web content management system as it becomes a content management system that you can push out web pages or you can push out XML objects or JSON objects or RSS feeds or, or several other types of output. Um, so that's, that, that's kind of nice. Um, we've also decided that it's not always good to invent everything yourself. There's a lot of great code out there in open source that can be reused. Um, Drupal 7, almost everything was, was homegrown code that was, that was built specifically for Drupal, with the exception of jQuery and a few JavaScript libraries. Um, it was mostly all homegrown code. With Drupal 8, we, we, we kind of looked at it and said, what's the best, you know, libraries out there that we can be using and, and, and not have to reinvent, it, re reinvent the wheel? So we've gone to taking a bunch of really good open source projects and incorporated those into Drupal. For example, Drupal 8 is built on the Symphony framework. Any PHP developers use the Symphony framework? One. Good. So now that's part of Drupal. Makes working on the core of Drupal so much easier now. It also means that when Symphony fixes something, it's automatically fixed in Drupal. If Drupal fixes it, that goes back to the Symphony community, and we help each other out that way. Um, another interesting thing about uh, Drupal 8 is the, the theming and templating library. Um, in Drupal 7, it was a homegrown thing, PHP templates, which were just kind of awful. Um, I love this quote by one of the developers. He says, in Drupal 7, we would hand the developers a gun and tell them to hammer in a nail with it and don't shoot themselves in the process. That's kind of how, how dangerous the theming level was. Excuse me. In Drupal 8, <coughs> excuse me, um, we've, we've adopted the Twig library which is kind of an industry standard in PHP for, for doing the templating. Um, we've also tried to build Drupal 8 so that it's built for modern data. So we added a bunch of um, data types, what are called content types in Drupal. So we have things like references to another object, or a date, or a link, or a, an email address, or a telephone number. Those are all standard objects now in, you know, in, in, in Drupal 8, where in Drupal 7 you would have had to go and, gone and, you know, <coughs> excuse me. 
In Drupal 7, you would have had to gone and downloaded third-party modules to get the, that sort of functionality built in. So let's take a break from the uh, from the slides here for a minute. And let's actually do it. See if I can do a quick demonstration here of what uh, what a, what a new installation of uh, of Drupal might look like here. So give me just one second. Get this set up. I don't. I don't need any internet connection for it. It's just. It's just local on the Give me just one second here. I'm trying to get this to see my local machine here. supposed to be on the local machine, so it shouldn't require the internet. That's strange. Let's try one other thing here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is this is what a, a brand new installation of, of Drupal would look like after it's installed, but I'm going to go ahead and blow away my settings and go ahead and do a uh, an installation from scratch here. Okay. Let's, let's try this again. So one of the first things you'll notice when you go to install Drupal is that in the old versions of Drupal, if you wanted to install in a different language other than English, 
you had to install it in English and then add that other language and then switch over to the new language. Um, with Drupal 8, we've added multilingual installation right from the beginning. So you can choose your language right from this drop down. And if you want to, pick, pick another language to install in. So if, if we wanted to do, uh, or something. We want to do German, for example. You could, you could pick that from the drop down and, and do it, do the rest of the installation in German. Now I don't speak German, so that would be kind of difficult for me. So we'll go ahead and do this in English. But know that, that what that would do is it would look on the local system and see if it had all the translations for that other language. If it doesn't, it'll automatically try to connect to the internet, download the latest translations, install those, and then go through the rest of the installation process. The next thing it's going to do in the installation here is ask us which type of installation profile do we want. The two default ones are standard or minimal. Um, you can add your own ins installation types. In this case, we just want to take the standard. Next, next it's going to ask us for information about our database. So I'm going to put the database name is install, uh, install demo. Hope that's what I called it. My username is Drupal. I have a really secret password. And of course, couldn't connect to the database, so I gotta check the database here and see what I see what I call it. Aha! I called it install test. Okay. All test. Drupal password. Okay, now it's connecting to the database. Now it's installing the different modules that are needed for Drupal. Um, again, if you've used Drupal before, um, the installation under Drupal 7 took a while. Um, we've really tried to streamline the installation, make it go much faster in Drupal 8. Okay, it's about a third of the way done. We'll give it just one more second, and then it'll be done. What you may notice as it's going through the installation is it's going through the different modules that are part of the core of Drupal and installing each one. There's about 39 core modules. And so it's going through each of those and installing those and, and setting up the database for us. We're on 35 of 39. Almost done. And that's just wrapping up, and we're done. That's all there is to, to it. It's installed and ready to go. Um, it brings up this page of information where we give our, our website a name, we give it an email address, a, 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 an admin username and password, and then we're ready to go. So I'm going to call this Hudson India 2015. I'll give it an email address. Put in my username for the administrator. Give it a good password. I can also set a, a, a default country. So let's set this to India. Put a time zone. Close enough. We can tell it whether to check for updates automatically. And also, if it checks for updates and see that, sees that there's an update out there, to send you an email to remind you, hey, you need to update your system. There may be some security patches up. Since it's just running on my local machine here, I'm going to uncheck that. And there we have a, a uh, Drupal 8 site, and it's ready to go. So 
Here's here, here's here's what the site looks like by default. Not nothing nothing great there. No no content there, but it's ready for us to start adding content. All right, let's switch back to the slides for a moment here. So one of the one of the things we focused on in, in Drupal 8 was to make the the end user experience the the experience of the, the the author or the editor or the people who are were actually building the content in the system to make it much better. Um so we focused on things like adding a a, a good editor right in the in the interface itself. So we have a WYSIWYG editor built right in so you don't have to add, add that as a again as a third party module right from the beginning. Um, we also made it so that you could edit titles and and, and content directly without without having to go in and, and 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 manually edit every single piece of content. And we also added some some better block management. So let me let me just show off a couple of those things here quickly. So we'll uh, jump 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 back to our demo here. And again, I apologize. I kind of have to look over my shoulder to do this. I'm going to go ahead and log in as the administrator here. And one of the first things you'll notice is that we have this nice toolbar across the top with content, structure, appearance, extend, configuration, people, reports, um, which makes it really nice to be able to you know jump into your administration right from a, a nice little tool, toolbar. You can also move that toolbar over on the side if you'd rather have it as a sidebar rather than a than, than on the top there. Um, we'll leave it at the top for now. Um, but if we go into content and we want to add some new content, let's just say we want to add a, add a quick article. So now we give it a title. Welcome to FUDCON. Let's give a quick body. This is, this is a test. If we want to, we can give this some tags. And we can even add an image. So I'll add that image that I used in my lightning talk, and there we go. Oh, it's saying I have to add some alternative text for uh, for uh, sight impaired people. Again, it encourages you to do the right thing with accessibility standards. And there we have this this new article. Now, anybody who's used Drupal 7 will be absolutely will be absolutely blown away when I can just come over here and you see this little pencil? I can click on that, say quick edit, and I can actually just right there on the screen start editing that. Oh, maybe maybe I want to change the uh the title here. So we want to save that body that that I made, and then I can come click on any of these things. Again, you just look look for the little pencil, and that's that's that that, that lets you know you can just do a quick edit there without going to the regular edit interface, which takes you back to what what it looked like when I created the content. So so quick editing and and uh, and improved editors is is one of the big features that we added. All right, moving on. Uh, the next thing that we focused on in Drupal 8 was what we call configuration management. So if you're working on 
a large Drupal installation, sometimes you want to make some changes and see how those are going to work. You want a development environment, and you make those changes in the development environment, and then you want to push those over to your live server, your production server. But it's always hard to keep those things in sync. If you make a change to one system, you have to remember to make the change to the other. And in older versions of Drupal, all that information was stored in the database, which meant you had to sync parts of the database over, but you didn't want to necessarily sync all of the database over. Um, so in Drupal 8, we've split the, the configuration out separately um, so that it's very easy to export either the entire configuration or a part of the configuration from one server, move it over to your production server, re reapply it there, and have those same changes come across, which is very, very slow. So here's more of a graphical explanation of how that would work. Let's say I have a development server over here on the left, a live server over on the right. We could take one of the configuration settings, export it to a file, take it over to the live server, re-import it from a file into the active store, and apply it um, to that server. Another thing we focused on in Drupal 8 is making the, the websites mobile friendly. Um, a good example of this is here on the left, is what a Drupal 7 site looks like by default on an iPhone or on a mobile device. It's not very readable. The menus don't work very well. It's, it's pretty hard to navigate. Um, you'll notice the one on the right, um, it's reformatted, resized things to, to work well on a mobile device. The menus collapse down and, and those sorts of things to, to work very, very, very well on, on mobile sites. And why is that important? It's because more and more people are, are viewing websites on a, on a smaller screen device, on a mobile device. And right now I would guess that probably close to 50% of all web traffic is, is viewed from a mobile device. But 50% of websites aren't designed for, to look, to look good on a mobile device. So that's one thing we need to focus on. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to talk a, a, a little bit about interconnectivity. Um, it used to be in Drupal that we kind of thought, you know, we were the king of the jungle and that, you know, the, the world re revolves around us and, and everybody should just do everything in Drupal. Over the last few years, we've, we've really come to realize that we need to play well with others. We need to, to be able to interoperate with, with other systems. And so one of the things that's been added in, in Drupal 8 is kind of a revamp of some of the interfaces that we use to, to you know, get Drupal to talk to other systems. Um, for example, um, we've now added a, a REST server in, and a REST client inside of Drupal. So you could have, you know, Drupal just as a back end and have something like Backbone or Angular or something like that as your front end that just talks to Drupal over a REST interface to get data in and out of the system. Or if you're migrating data from one system to another, you can now use you know, the REST protocol to, to push objects in or get objects out of, uh, of a Drupal site, which makes migrating from other sites or communicating with other systems a whole lot easier. Um, for those of you who use Drupal 7, how many people use the Views module? It's like the most important module, I think, or maybe the second most important module in, in Drupal that was not a part of Drupal 7. Um, so we've added the, the views module into the core of Drupal. So now if you want to create a list of objects or a list of content um, that match certain criteria, that sort of thing, that's very, very easy to do in Drupal 8 because it's part of the core. Not only is it part of the core, but all those views are now mobile responsive, um, ready to go, um, ready, you know, ready for translation, all, all that, that, that good stuff that comes along with being part of Drupal 8. To give you a kind of a, a more graphical representation of why that's important, I've got this little uh, graph right here. So it shows that uh, Drupal 7 was released in January of 2011. And that's that, that, uh, that light brown bar. And you see that there was almost no adoption at all of Drupal 7 until a year later. Um, well, six months later when Views came out with a release candidate, so it would finally start working with Drupal 7. Then people started to use Drupal 7. It wasn't until a full year later that Views came out for Drupal 7, and, and that really drove adoption. So that, that was a clear indicator to us that people are, are not willing to use Drupal without the Views module, so it should be part of the, the core of Drupal. 
Um, I want to finish up here quickly with just uh, a couple of things. Um, if you're interested in Drupal, um, if you're interested in the content management system, now is the time to start playing with it. Don't wait until Drupal 8 is released and then say, oh, I wish I would have had this feature in there, or oh, I found this bug, I wish it would have been fixed earlier. Now is the time to to uh, start looking at that. Don't wait until, you know, code starts getting thrown over the wall here um, to, 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 to look at things. Don't be surprised by the attack that's coming, you know. Go look at the code now. It's out there. It's available. It's 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 very usable at this point. Like I said, there's only a few. You know, there's just a handful of bugs that are keeping us from from doing the release. Um, so so don't don't be afraid to do that. Um, how many people know this board game? Board game called Risk. Anybody ever played Risk? It's one of my favorite board games. Um, but I use this to illustrate the fact that there's very little risk in trying out a Drupal site now, especially a Drupal eight site. Go install it. Play with it. It's not hard to install. You saw how easy it was to, to get up and running. Um, play with it and try it out and figure out what, what works and, and that sort of thing. Don't be afraid to dive into the code because it's, it's very, very powerful. So uh, I think I've got uh, just a little bit under 10 minutes left. I wanted to leave some time for questions. If, if people have questions or, or things they want to see me do, I'm, I'm happy to try to do live demos of, of things you want to see done in Drupal. Um, I think there's some microphones we can pass around, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Come on, there's don't don't be shy. There's got to be at least one question out there. Ah, question right here in the front. Sorry for asking this. How do you compare with uh, Plone? How do we compare with Plone? Um, so I was a big fan of Plone back in the good old days of Plone. Um, but to, to, to put it bluntly, Plone exploded. And the development community in, inside of Plone kind of scattered. And there's a, still a few people using Plone. But it does not have the development traction that uh, that Drupal has. I mean, Drupal powers uh, a good percentage of the top 10,000 websites in the world. Um, anybody who's anybody that's doing content management these days is doing it in Drupal and not doing it in Plone. Um, there's just there's just so few people using Plone anymore that it's most people have moved over to the either Drupal camp or, or one of the others. But Drupal by far has the most kind of you know momentum behind it right now and, uh, and and certainly heavy heavy adoption and you know most most web web development agencies and shops are are, are using group yeah. don't don't get me wrong I liked Plone back when it was the hot shiny thing but that's been many many years since it's really had a lot of active development there is no much development or improvement happened in Plone recently right? okay I'll have to I'll have to check it out again Obviously, the other difference is that, you know, that Plone is Python and uh, Drupal is PHP, but we won't get into the language wars right now. All right, other questions, other things you'd like to see done? There's the, uh, there we go, we got a hand, hand back there. So I was interested a bit about uh, how is this uh, REF model being implemented in terms of using content frameworks? Over Drupal, uh, like Angular or something like that. Okay, so so if if I understood the question the question correctly, it's let's say you wanted to use Drupal on the back end, but you wanted to use something like Angular or something on the front end. How how would that be implemented? So basically, what you do is you build a you know you build your Angular app, and then it makes REST requests back to Drupal to say, hey, grab this piece of content, you know, whether it's information about a user or information about a node information about an article, information about an RSS feed. In that um, case, uh, Drupal itself uh, does not uh, act as a content management system, but rather as a backend server kind of system. It, it, it can do both, but there's a lot of people who w want to use Drupal 8 as the backend, but don't want to use it as the front end. So you can use it as both, but some people want to use something like Angular as their front end. And use and just use Drupal as the back end. So a good example of this is weather.com. Weather.com is built on Drupal. And 
but they have a custom front end that they've built that just uses REST calls to call back to the Drupal backend, and Drupal just handles things on the back. It doesn't actually display any of the information on the website. That's all done in, in a front end. Does that answer your question? Yeah. If, if you need more details, come come up, up to me afterwards, and I'd, I'd go into more detail. Okay, there's a question in the back over here. Uh, how Drupal 8 is better than uh, other competitors like WordPress? So how is how is Drupal 8 better than some of its competitors like WordPress? Um, there's a couple of things that I really like about Drupal that are really hard to do in WordPress. And let me show you just one of those quickly here. Um, I like WordPress that it's very simple to get started and, and, and add pages and posts. But in WordPress, when you get beyond pages and posts and want, want to create what are called custom content types or custom post types, that's, you basically have to dive into the code to create different types of content. In, in, uh, Drupal, it's very, very simple to, uh, to create a new code types or content type. So let's let's just do a quick demo here. Let's get back to the browser. So if we go to content here, um, here's we obviously ha have our content, but we can add content types. Uh, oh, sorry, it's under structure. Content types. And so we can create our own custom content type. Maybe we want something that, that doesn't just have a title and a body and tags and a, you know, and an image. Maybe we want something that has other fields as well. So let's create a new content type. Let's just call it a person. If we want, we could give it a description and those sorts of things. But instead of having a title, the person needs a name, right? And then we can jump in and say, well, what, what type of fields does a person have? Well, a person doesn't necessarily need a body field, so we can delete that. Instead, maybe we want to add a field for their um, email address. And we say, okay, we want it to be, each person to have one email address. That's good enough. And we can set a default setting if we want, but that's fine. We'll just save that. Okay, so now we have they, they have a they have a name, they have an email address. Let's add another field. Um, let's add a. What should we add? Let's add an image. So we can add add that as their picture. Okay. Save that. We don't need a default. That's good enough. Okay. So now we've got this content type that's got, you know, a person. It's got their, their name, their email address, their picture. And now if we go to content and add new content, suddenly we have this person type here that we can add. And it's that simple to create new new types of content, where that would take us lots and lots of code in, in WordPress to, to add a new custom post type. So that's that's one of the biggest differences I see between WordPress and Drupal, is Drupal is meant for a richer set of, uh, of objects and types that you can put into the system. Time for probably one more question, and then it's time to wrap up. Right here in the front. Okay. Uh, hello. Got it. Oh, over here, one over there. Yeah. So, from a security perspective, what is new in the latest Drupal, and what kind of, if I have to set up a site, or if somebody has to set up a site, are there any hardening uh, features that are involved in the new latest Drupal? Okay. So, from a from a security standpoint, there's two things in Drupal eight that are very very important from a security standpoint. Um, with Drupal seven. Um, the, the biggest problems were cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. Um, 
Because of the new templating engine in Drupal 8, we actually went through and, and verified all the code paths um, to make sure we're, we're not, we don't have any, you know, we're not specifically adding anything new that would cause cross-site scripting or you know, cross-site request forgery attacks. Um, the new templating engine also makes it much, much harder to mix your logic with your theming, and it automatically escapes all output by default, so so really helps with the cross-site scripting you know, sort of thing. Um, from a harden, hardening standpoint, um, not a lot specifically to hardening, but keep your Drupal site up to date. Too many times people go and, 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 and launch, and this is the same for WordPress or any other con web content management system. They go and they launch a site and they forget about it. They don't keep it up to date. You know, vulnerabilities are discovered. Somebody comes along and, 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 and hacks your site and uses uses it for malicious purposes. So keep it up to date. One of the things, like I said, that I love about Drupal 8 is it will check for updates, and then it will email you to say, hey, there's a new security update available. You should go apply that update. All right. I wish we could get to your question. We're out of time, but come grab me out, out in the hallway or after the talk, and I'd be happy to answer your question. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the conference.